Gardening Program. I'm Jerry Horner, and today with me is Tony LaCasey. Good morning. And he is also a member of the Bella Vista Garden Club, and he is uh, a fellow Master Gardener in Benton County. And he's going to be talking about organic gardening today, uh, gardening the natural way. Thank you. And um, there are ser several things coming up in April that we wanted to talk about uh, first is to let you know to mark your calendars. Uh, last month on the gardening program, I told you about the gardening seminar that the Bella Vista Garden Club is uh, holding. And it's on April 17th, 10 o'clock to 12.30 at the Plaza um, Dining Room in the uh, Highlands Crossing. And last month I said there would be a $5 charge for the seminar, but we have uh, changed our mind on that, and we're just going to make this a free seminar. So you don't have to pay anything to come to the seminar. But since seating is limited, you do need to make a reservation. So uh, if you could just call um, Elsie Taylor at 876-5035, or you can email bvgardenclub at gmail.com uh, gmail uh, to make your reservation. You'll probably see flyers around the village like this. Um, this has all the information about uh, what's at the seminar and who to contact. So look for these flyers around the, the village. We've got them at the banks and harps and allens and so forth. Um, this is really a seminar for those of the people that don't really want to commit to being a garden club member or a master gardener, but they want information about how to garden. So it's going to be um, a lot of information from our fellow master gardeners and garden club members who've been there, done that, and know how to deal with the rocks and the problems in Bella Vista. So there's also master gardeners to help you answer any of your questions. You have, we'll have a question answer session too. So I hope you can attend the garden seminar and we're hoping to make this a, an annual event or even um, a biannual event, do it twice a year or so. And then we're also going to have um, re light refreshments and um, our garden boutique will be there to buy per to purchase uh, gardening items, and um, we also have handouts, and uh, we'll have some attendance prizes. So you might come walk away with a plant or something. So, and there's several plant sales coming up in April. On Saturday, April 17th, and Saturday, April 24th, from 8 to 12, there will be sales at the Village Wastewater Company, and that's off Highway 71 near the Missouri Line, and Nature's Calling, Bella Vista Garden Club, and the Ozark Hills Daily Club um, will be selling plants. And the Bella Vista Spring plant sale, our large plant sale, will be on Saturday, May 1st at Tanyard Creek, or Tanyard Pavilion, from 8 to 1. And Tony is our digging and potting um, chairman for the plant sale. Mm -hmm. And you are in the thick of things right now with this I'm plant in, sale. I'm in the thick of things, <laughs> <laughs> to say the least. Right. <laughs> so if you can let us know what's going on with that plant sale, well, and what to expect. Well, uh, luckily uh, this year we have a lot of people in Bella Vista that have had gardens here for a number of years, and they they're donating a lot of plants, so we're thinning out a lot of gardens, right. and uh, uh, hopefully we're going to have. Uh, uh, close to 2,000 plants down oh, there. Oh, that's wonderful. And uh, it's a great way for people to save right. money on their home gardens because most of these plants are about 75% less than they would be at, uh, at a nursery. So well, the nursery prices are really going up. Yep, they really and, are. And they, and they are. So and, mm -hmm. uh, and, of course, all the money goes to charity. Right. This is our main uh, fundraiser for the right. club, right. and it's how we support our scholarships to the Northwest right. um, Arkansas Community College. We give those scholarships to horticulture students there and it helps with our other community projects which are numerous around the around the village right. so so Tony on organic gardening um, how long have you been uh, gardening organically well this is my 40th anniversary oh my gosh. <laughs> <Actually>. <laughs> started in 1970 actually yes Wow and what made you go to that uh, organic gardening well you know in uh, 1970 uh, my, um, I had two daughters, and, uh, and they had their little friends all, we were in a typical middle class neighborhood and, and a lot of children, and so children were always at our place uh, playing. And um, I just woke up one day uh, when I was out there uh, uh, spraying toxic chemicals around the mm -hmm. place, and my children were playing in this. 
And uh, so uh, I got to thinking, what did we, what did people do in their gardens before World War II, mm -hmm. before all these products came on the market? I mean, weren't there any pretty gardens? Mm -hmm. So I started doing research and found that there were fabulous estates all over the world that had magnificent gardens uh, prior to the chemical revolution. And even the gardens at Versailles were that way. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then of course I looked at nature as well. Mm -hmm. You know, the beautiful things that grow in nature naturally without any help from us. So uh, that's what sort of uh, uh, got me going on the quest. So you've been here about two years, and how did you deal with the rocks in Bella Vista? <laughs> you know, the, are there organic rocks too? <laughs> well, you know, I'm coming from Texas where I've, I've d had to deal with heavy clay soils and flat land to come to these, to, uh, to the hills and, uh, and the rocks and hearing all the stories about the rocks. But I learned something in the, I prefer to call it uh, gardening the natural way. But uh, 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 in that community, uh, the f you learn the, f the three major rules of gardening the natural way, regardless of the soil, whether it's clay or sandy or rocky or whatever, and that's amend the soil. That's rule number one. Right. Rule number two is amend the soil. Right. And rule number three is amend the soil. Amen, amen, amen. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and, uh, you know, the proof of that is, is that when we first moved in the house, it was a, a new home, um, and uh, the builder threw a few little things out there with some terrible soil and some terrible mulch, and I just scraped that away right away, and I just worked a, uh, uh, a lot of organic material into a little day because uh, I wanted some color up front right away in a small area. And uh, for two years now, everything that's gone in that bed has stopped traffic. Oh, wow. And they've all survived the winters. And the only change to that native soil was making a 50-50 mixture of, of carbon-based materials and the native soil. Okay, so what type of products do you use to, uh, to amend the soils? Well, of course, my favorite is homemade compost. Yes. I mean, that's, that's number one. And, uh, and then I usually add to that some volcanic uh, rock materials uh, like uh, Texas green sand, which is rich in iron. Right, and I've heard of green sand, but where do you purchase that? Well, that's a difficult thing, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm having a little problem with this natural state license tag because <laughs> I'm having a hard time finding natural products. Right. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, at this point, uh, you, can, you can, I believe, I think Nitron down in um, uh, uh, Johnson, right. I think has Texas green sand. I haul it back from the Dallas Metroplex. Oh, you bring your own in. I uh, bring my own <laughs> okay. in. And lava sand, any of the volcanic rock materials uh, are a benefit. Uh, I add sugars like molasses. For example, molasses. dried molasses. Really? It, they stimulate the microbes in the soil. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Cornmeal uh, is another product that I use. Uh, cotton burr compost. Now that I can get up mm -hmm. here readily. Several nurseries uh, carry it, including the box stores. And uh, that's the first thing that I put in the soil when I first got up here that I got good results. Just that's cotton burr because I could cotton. find it right away within eight minutes of the house worked in the material, uh, and then you have a, a great resource here in northwest Arkansas. We're just uh, a short drive away from Miami, uh, Oklahoma, mm -hmm. uh, where they have all those great mushroom uh, uh, facilities. Right. So that mushroom compost, I've fallen in love with that product. I know, too. We've, we've hauled uh, mushroom compost um, from Miami in truckloads yep, yep. Um, and in several uh, plant sales. Right. When we were uh, potting, we right. were adding the, the mushroom compost right. to a topsoil. Right. Yep. Love, love the material. Uh, the only uh, word of caution that I, I know about it is, is that uh, if you have acid-loving plants, mm -hmm. like azaleas, uh, you want to be a, you know, not go overboard with mushroom compost. Right. It seems to rob the, uh, you know, to, it absorbs a lot of acid that it takes away from the plant. Mm -hmm. um, and dogwoods right. would be another, uh, for example. Rhododendrons. But just a know. light, light yeah, application yeah, is right, exactly. better. Right. Okay. And then how do you um, uh, how do you mulch your plants? What do you use for mulch? Well, <laughs> uh, 
and believe it or not, I'm, I'm, I'm ultra with compost. <laughs> that and, and of course, the one you make yourself is the best. But I guess uh, the very best uh, mulch you can use is your native shredded hardwoods that's been composted. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't want it when it's still green, it's got too much nitrogen in it, it leaches too many things, it leaves tar deposits, but if you leave it in a pile, let it age, you know, for six months and then use it, you've got, you know, that's really your very best top dressing. Uh, native shredded uh, uh, um, cedar, mm -hmm. okay, is a great product uh, for mulching, uh, pecan shells, well, I've tried pecan shells. Okay. I tried those in my front bed, and, and they just disappeared in one year. Yeah. And Short they were ev they were everywhere. The wind blew them away. Yeah. I mean, they were just so light, yeah. and you know, I, they didn't yeah. work. But. Well, nice. It's an alternative, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, you know, uh, shredded leaves too. But mm -hmm. again, the native shredded hardwoods and the native shredded cedars are really the best. They seem to lock in really good. Mm -hmm. They break down slower. Uh, and um, you know it's really the best. I usually mulch if I've just planted something new, especially in the fall if I've put a new plant in the ground mm -hmm. and I want to protect it from the winter. Uh, I'll mulch over my hostas. Uh, you know, thing I don't uh, use a lot of the hard materials for mulching so much. Uh, just for the new plants or very, very tender Once things they're established in the them. winter. But yeah. one, you know, but for, for just general mulching, I, I just find it easier to weed and to, easier to cultivate the garden and everything if I just have a nice blanket of, of compost laying on top of the ground. Right. So. And then if, um, if you don't use pesticides, what do you do to get rid of those, these garden pests? <laughs> well, you know, everybody worries about the bugs and people seem to overreact to it. I always you know, I, I don't know. I think it's a cultural thing. I've, I remember when my uh, youngest daughter first got married. They bought this brand new house in a Dallas suburb, and uh, they were just still moving in and setting up, and hadn't had all the pictures hung on the wall yet. And my uh, uh, my son-in-law discovered some ants at the corner of the house, and he ran down to a big box store and. <laughs> Jerry, he came back <laughs> with enough chemicals. I, oh my God. I could have taken out a small country in Central America <laughs> with the amount of chemicals in here. <laughs> so I think that, you know, sometimes we overreact to these right. things and we need to remember that 98% of those, uh, that the insects in the garden are beneficial insects. Right. And so if we provide habitat uh, and don't destroy all the habitat around our house for beneficials, uh, will have uh, uh, less of a problem. Uh, then you can, uh, uh, you know, if you're devoid of some beneficial insects, you can introduce them to your to your landscape and to your garden. My favorites are ladybugs. Oh, they're the best. You know, they're the best. And uh, um, uh, 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 you know, you can order them online. Mm -hmm. uh, the best time to put them out is in the evening. You know, just spray a little water on your plants. Just about the time the sun goes down, release the ladybugs. They'll set up housekeeping. Uh, I've had problems in the past. I usually don't have it very often, but many, many years ago, I had a big aphid problem. Mm -hmm. yeah, oh, they and love aphids. On, they on love the aphids. tender little rose buds, mm -hmm. and uh, just before they would open, and I released the ladybugs mm -hmm. one night like that. Went out the next morning with my cup of coffee to get the paper, and you couldn't find an aphid. <laughs> well, they're, they're <laughs> heavy eaters. I know right. they love aphids. Uh, praying mantises, like mm -hmm. praying mantises. Um, uh, one of my favorites is uh, trichogramma wasp, you know, and you can mm -hmm. uh, release those. Had a pecan tree once, and uh, was a great uh, bear. I used to get, you know, 150, 200 pounds of pecans off of it every year, and one year, all of a sudden, for some reason, I had uh, pecan case bores. And uh, mm -hmm. so uh, I got on the computer and they sent me a little packet, nailed it to the tree. Uh, they materialized and uh, established a colony. I, I did it every year for three years, never had to do it again. And uh, I bet uh, I didn't have 3% of my crop had, had the boars in it anymore. Mm -hmm. And then of course for the soil, uh, soil-borne insects, I like beneficial nematodes to go in there and, and, and be my be my, my soil army okay. for me to keep the bad guys out. Is that the um, milky spore? Is that what you use? No, milky no? spore really is uh, more, creates up a, a virus for them and you know, they die more of a virus than, 
uh, the nematode is just a, a, a soil-borne uh, microorganism mm -hmm. that uh, will attack uh, larvae, beetle larvae, uh, will attack uh, termite larvae, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. In well, the do you use milky spore for the uh, grubs? Uh, I have. Uh, I started that when I first got up here. We didn't have that problem in Texas, mm -hmm. and having moved up here, and I and I heard about it, and, and I, I did try it. But you know, the uh, just for nothing else but the Japanese beetles, because they mm -hmm. are a problem here, and it's a new problem for me. And well, uh, it's a fairly new problem for us <laughs> here too. We, we've yeah, really been right. tested the last few years. But I found that the beetles are, you know, they're coming in from 50 yards away, 100 yards mm -hmm. away, 150 yards away. So I said, you know, I can put milky spore out there all day, and I don't know that I'm going to. Well, so it does take time for that to work in the yeah, soil. Yeah, about three too, years. About three I years, but it lasts yeah. a long time, yeah. you know, too. And uh, the other thing on these beetles, I I just cringe when I hear people say they put up a beetle trap you know, to trap the beetles. Right. All they're doing is attracting that the beetles to their garden and getting more and more and more, you know. Uh, yeah, so it right. just, it just, uh, I understand I they shudder can, when they I can see sense that. that bait a long way a long off way. is what I've heard. Right, and, uh, and you know, if you have Japanese beetles and you put up a trap, you're gonna have 10 times more. So I, I really don't like those traps at all. Unless you have a neighbor way down the road who right. <laughs> can talk him into it. <laughs> I've uh, been thinking about maybe setting them off in the woods maybe mm -hmm. and on some undeveloped properties to right. see if that might help. I really didn't have a problem the first year. People told me I was crazy putting mm -hmm. roses out. Right, you they know, love and roses. I, yeah, I was planting roses. My neighbors all came running, oh, you don't want to plant roses. <laughs> so, uh, but you know, I only had maybe half a dozen or so. And um, uh, my thumb and index finger worked great. Right, <laughs> right. Uh, That's just put that little death clamp on them. Well, I'm but, not a total but the uh, second year, organic last, gardener. Yeah, though. last year I had more of a problem with them. So, yeah. Well, uh, I'm not a total organic gardener. I try to be organic, but I'm not uh, totally well, you know, I'm working my way. <laughs> I'm, working, I'm well. working that way. But as far as Japanese beetles go, a rubber glove with a little, you know, right. crunch and, you know, yeah. just get rid of yeah. them that way. Yeah. That's you, my You need answer. to, uh, if you're going to be a gardener, my philosophy is you need to be in your garden every day. Yeah. And if uh, people, um, you know, a lot of times I hear, you know, people, in the spring, they work really hard, they clean out their gardens, right. they plant a lot of new stuff, and then three months later they come back and uh, they say, look at all these weeds, or right. look at the, these bugs ate this thing to the ground, uh, and three months is just, uh, you know, uh, you're really not a gardener, right. you know, you need right. to be out there basically every day. Well, I just hate to see these gardeners that work out in the garden and just constantly work and work and work, and then they never enjoy it. They never sit and right. enjoy it or, right. you know, look at it and watch the, the you know, plants bloom, right. and, you know, they're well, just working of, all the, the time. A lot of the things I do in my garden is when I, you know, when I go out uh, early in the morning, it's just a leisurely stroll, mm -hmm. a cup of coffee, and I, there's little things that, you know, you s snip a little dead limb or mm -hmm. you squish a Japanese beetle right. or, you know, you see a little problem that you say, I'll need to get to that later. Right. Right. And then again in the evening after dinner, it's mm -hmm. nice to go back and visit the garden again. And, and I think it's, I think it's like with our health. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we all have annual checkups and mm -hmm. semi-annual checkups because, you know, we want to nip a bad problem in the bud right. with ourselves. And the plants are living organisms, too, mm -hmm. just like we are. And uh, somebody needs to be looking out for them. Yeah, on a daily basis. You know, on a daily, daily basis, basis, right. And what do you do about black spot on roses? You talked about roses, but what do you do with black spot? It's a real problem. Yeah, it really yeah, is. It, it, uh, it is. Uh, and I found that out <laughs> very quickly. <laughs> Uh, these um, uh, these heavy dews that you get at night is mm -hmm. something that I'm not accustomed to either. Living in an arid, more of an arid environment in all my life, and uh, but I just use the same practices, things that I didn't have to do very often uh, where I came from, that I have to do more often here, and I was able to get it under control. Uh, one of the the first things that I learned about roses is is. Uh, um, get them on the east side <laughs> rather than the west side. Uh, my, my, or the least at my house because the west side I had not too far away um, across the street I had some rather large trees. Mm -hmm. And so the night's moisture was sitting on the leaves uh, from say six, seven o'clock in the evening until almost 11 the next day, 12 o'clock mm -hmm. before uh, any, any sun got to them. And so we're, we're talking there, uh, you know, almost uh, 
uh, what would that be, 12, 15, 16 hours mm -hmm. of being damp out of a 24-hour day. It was way too long. Yeah, that invites uh, the mold right there. Right, so when you move them to the east side where they get that morning sun immediately and mm -hmm. they've got a good six hours of morning sun, that period of moisture or dampness is shortened, mm -hmm. and that seemed to help. The other thing is, is uh, um, we learned from Texas A&M uh, uh, Ag Department, they, uh, they were experimenting one time uh, with propagating some peanut starlings, and they were trying them in all different kinds of mediums and mixes, and they noticed that the ones that were in cornmeal had no fungal problems at all. Mm. So they conducted further tests and found out that your basic household cornmeal is a fungicide. It's a natural fungicide. And so I broadcast uh, cornmeal at the bottom of the plant, uh, sometimes on a weekly basis, depending okay, now on how, how bad much, it is. Okay, now how much do you put on each plant? I, I tell people, you know, put it on like you sprinkle cheese on your spaghetti. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, well, up, that's, up, that's under a the, up under the plant. Right. And uh, if you have a really bad case, uh, you can get any little container like, uh, like an old sock or a pair of a lady's nylons, the tip of it, or piece of cheesecloth and you can put uh, a cup of cornmeal uh, in there and drop it uh, down in a gallon of water and take it out in the morning and then go spray that. You so know. use that for a spray mm -hmm. rather yep. than any fungicide. Yep. Or a drench. You can do it as a drench. Mm -hmm. You know, it uses a lot more material, but you can put it um, in a uh, spray type, uh, uh, you know, a from bucket spray. with a spray head on it mm -hmm. and drench the plant. Uh, now, how often do you do that if you have a problem? It's just really if you have a weekly, you don't mm -hmm. need to do these things more than weekly or after a large rain, mm -hmm. if there's a really big rain, heavy rain, an inch or more, you know, I'd, I would repeat it mm -hmm. as soon as the weather dries up. Uh, and of course, boric acid, you know, uh, works well too. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, baking soda, not baking boric. So baking, baking soda. soda. I've heard of baking four, soda. Four teaspoons, uh, you know, to a gallon of water mm -hmm. uh, works well. and. Uh, and a compost tea works really good, mm -hmm. too. Well, know. I bought some um, cornmeal because mm -hmm. I know you've mentioned that, so yeah. I'm going to try using it. But is there any place you can get it in bulk? I mean, Well, believe it or not, there is. You know, y you can use cornmeal from the grocery store. The best is horticultural cornmeal. And again, these are things I'm trying to get some nurseries to get in step with here. Okay. Uh, the funny part is horticultural cornmeal has more of the kernel in it. and the feed stores, you can buy it, they feed it to the hogs, mm -hmm. you know, so our hogs are eating better than we are. The one <laughs> at the grocery store has been robbed <laughs> of a lot of the good trace elements. Right. So, uh, yeah, you can uh, just, you can buy cornmeal at a feed store, and that's really a better cornmeal. The nice thing about it, not only is it, is it a herbicide, I mean a fungicide, but it's also a soil amendment because it's 100% carbon. You're just adding more oh. carbon material you're, you know, so you're just the enriching soil. the soil too. And it's a mild, mild fertilizer. Mm -hmm. So it's three in one. It's a three. There three is nothing one. bad about it. And if okay. you inhale the dust, you know, chances are you're not going to have a big tumor someday. <laughs> you know, that's, so that's I mean, these too. are all things that sit well with me anyway. Right. And then what about weeds? How do you handle the weed problem? <laughs> well, you know, we were talking before about. Uh, uh, you know, uh, people, you know, clean up the garden and then disappear for three mm -hmm. months, come back and go, oh, look at all the weeds. <laughs> um, uh, my uh, favorite uh, tool <laughs> uh, is uh, I splurge one year. I, my wife to this day doesn't know what I spent for it, but... <laughs> well, we, we won't tell her. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, um, I bought from Smith & Hawken this uh, hoe from Japan. And uh, it's a highly tempered, nice steel hoe that is uh, in a triangular shape. It's very triangular with very pointed tips. Mm -hmm. I keep a very, very sharp edge on it. And the wood in the handle is extremely lightweight, but it's very strong. And as I walk the garden, usually in the evening uh, after dinner, and I just go for a walk, any little mm -hmm. thing that sticks its head up that I don't like the looks of, I just reach out there and give it a little with my just, just a little flick off. of the wrist and okay. that's it it's a, you don't work up any perspiration doing okay. that it's a simple thing and then I have a liquid spray and my liquid um, spray that I use is and you can now I see it in the stores up here you can buy 20% vinegar now in mm -hmm. gallon jugs mm -hmm. and to that I add uh, an ounce of orange oil 
-hmm. And to that, uh, uh, just an eyedropper of a wetting agent. Uh, you can use liquid laundry detergent, but mm -hmm. I prefer, again, to use uh, either a teaspoon of molasses or a teaspoon of just mm -hmm. household honey, you know, just some honey. Just Something to give it a little sticky. Right. And um, uh, I've, I've just put in some new gardens, which I told you about mm -hmm. earlier, and I put in uh, the crushed limestone, which they use up here a lot, mm -hmm. garden paths. And wouldn't you know, some pesky little weeds are sticking their heads oh, up. Oh, those weeds. And so I don't want to be hoeing in there. And so uh, even with these cool and damp temperatures we've had this spring, I've been just walking out there and get a little mm -hmm. spritz here and there once in a while. And I go out the next morning, they're gone. gone. Well, Tony, thank you so yeah. much for all this information on organic gardening. We'll try to get some more of that information on our website yeah. and maybe have a page for organic gardening. But we need to talk real quickly about things to do in April. Um, for um, the gardeners out there. Okay. And we have to remember to put the hummingbird feeders out. Absolutely. Uh, the uh, leaves, you have to get the leaves out from under the shrubs so you don't have a blanket that right. to keep the uh, rain from getting to the plants. Annuals, um, we have to get the bedding plants set out, but you can't put them out yet. It's too right. early. A early. The last killing frost date is usually April 20th, but we've had it up to you know, May 13th. So you just have to watch your, um, yep. your uh, Forecast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't, the herbs don't, don't get you, too excited you too can't early. send. You can't set out your basil yet, and I just no. found out you couldn't put basil out until it's at least 50 degrees consistently at night. It's, right. it's just a stopper. Exactly. They stop growing. Right. Bulbs. You have to leave your foliage on your bulb um, for at least six weeks on your tulips and daffodils. Right. Um, most of your perennials can be divided. You've been dividing the perennials. Oh, I've been dividing you know, a lot of perennials. Right. And you can fertilize your lawns with right. some of these natural fertilizers right. after they've greened up about two or three weeks. Um, the roses, we talked about a little bit about watching that black spot right. and catching right. it first. Yep. Um, you can feed your rhododendrons and your azaleas Absolutely. after they bloom. Right. Um, you want to prune out any winter damage in your um, evergreens. I've found with this winter has been the worst winter we've had I in, noticed I don't know, that too, and that's 30, uh, 40 years. Yeah, I and it. there's a there's a lot of damage to the evergreens. Right. So we'll have to just kind of watch them as they come out and just prune out that damage. Um, the vegetables, uh, well you can plant most of your vegetables late um, April, early May. Some of the earlier vegetables have gone out already. They're your um, kale and, mm -hmm. and hearty vegetables. Right. But your tomatoes, I would wait on tomatoes until May, May first. or later. <laughs> or later. Um, <laughs> I can remember carrying those little vegetable, those little things into the garage every night, and then pulling them out during yeah. the day, and then pulling them in. It was like May fifteenth yeah. one year. And that's stress on a plant. It does. It stresses them, and they're right. not going to grow. No. Until it right. gets warm, and they're not going to produce fruit any sooner. No. Nope. So you no. have to just let them, um, just be patient and not get them out too soon. So. Um, and then if you have any other questions about the gardening seminar, um, remember um, it's on April 14th, April 17th. And also the Master Gardener Hotline, I think they've been showing the, um, the um, number for the Master Gardener Hotline. It's just such a great, great resource to get your questions answered. Um, and they're there from a Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And I guess that's wraps up our show today and I hope you've enjoyed it and we'll hope you will tune in again next month and until then don't forget to smell the roses. <laughs>